Ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to Sydney Atheist for our uh, monthly talk. Um, tonight we've got a very entertaining speech by a very entertaining gentleman, and that's uh, Jim Muscari. Yeah, Muscari. Um, that's actually only an alias, but Muscari is what Jim's going to be talking about mainly tonight. So we, the discussion this evening is psychedelic mushrooms, fertility cults, and the origin of religion. Please welcome Jim. <laughs> Is, uh, because we're going to start to explore the fertility cults. Now, <clears throat> we're, uh, we'll, look, we'll first look at the psilocybin mushrooms, but also Syrian rue, acacia trees, and the psychedelic experience. We'll look at the fecundity of Mother Earth and the divine fertilization. Right? We'll look at the temple layout that mimicked female reproductive organs and priests as the divine male, female, uh, male and female temple prostitutes and their unexpected duties. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, look at, we'll look at the secrecy and initiation into the fertility cult and the impact upon the Indian, Egyptian, Zoroastrian and Jewish religion and the inclusion of that cult into Christianity actually <coughs> morphed into Christianity. Um, the extensive images of psilocybin mushrooms in 12th century books, architecture, and stained glass windows. We'll look at mushrooms as used by druids, vikings, fairies, witches, Santa Claus, and Christmas trees, and modern fairy tales. <laughs> Naturally, to cover this uh, extensive rich ground, uh, I'm uh, going to be just touching on the areas uh, of which I hope you may wish to explore further. Now, okay, everyone knows about fake news, where total fiction is portrayed as fact. Uh, absolutely, the all-time masters of portraying fiction as fact is religion. Just about nothing presented as fact or history by the various religions has actually been verified with architecture or any other science-based disciplines. <clears throat> Religion generally, and Christianity in particular, is a political system, um, very much as sort of the case with Islam as well, intended to control and manip manipulate people. It uses fear guilt, shame, and a good dose of blind faith. Uh, <clears throat> just to digress a second, fear, guilt, and shame are the three legs that hold up the edifice of religion, all right? So I'm sure you guys know that. <clears throat> um, unfortunately, we seem to have left behind the time when heretics were burned. Fortunately, guys, we're gonna get out of here alive today, so, okay. <laughs> All right, religion is, as a method of control is way more effective than coercion and force, and it's a great deal less expensive too. Uh, typically, religions claim to start by divine revelation and to be entirely separate and distinct from any other previously revealed or simultaneous cult or other religion. And, okay, this is both arrogant and illogical. Uh, so, it is. Most religions are arrogant and illogical, so we're on, we're on firm ground here. Uh, tonight, we're going to look at how the ancient psychedelic drug cult became the last, the holy last supper of Christianity. Uh, it was once said, comparing the oppressive control of the society by priests that the church is like a beech tree, that nothing flourishes under it. 
Now, for years you don't know, a beech tree is a particularly dense tree. Uh, it grows in Europe. <coughs> Pretty much always just have bare dirt under it. And uh, no growth whatsoever below its branches. Uh, just can't get any light. So <coughs> this is just like the church, which has always stifled and stood firmly against innovation and growth. Nothing flourishes under the church. Except pedophilia. Hmm? Except pedophilia. Yeah. <laughs> 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 hey, you're so right. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> Here we are. Let's just have a look at this for a second. Um, this is uh, just the eastern Mediterranean, and this is basically where the, the, the three big religions have kicked off from. And just look, you've got all the communications through the, the Mediterranean, the Black Sea, um, up through the Persian Gulf, the Red Sea. So there's a lot of sea communications. There's the Nile, which is not, not shown here. And here's the Euphrates and the Tigris. So you, it, it, there is an incredible lot of uh, traffic uh, and trade. But also, this was the place where they were bringing uh, camel trains across from China and India, and uh, probably Russia up, uh, up from Africa, and uh, through from Arabia. But these, these uh, the goods, so, so it's a huge trade. In, in stuff. So when people talk about suddenly having the word of God and divine revelation, it's such a rubbish. There's, there's trade routes flying everywhere, bringing uh, all sorts of things. Now the goods carried were generally lightweight, high value. So we had fabric, cosmetics, gemstones, dyes, herbs, and more than anything, and particularly drugs. Right? <clears throat> No different to today, really, is it? So th there's a great deal more profit in 100 kilograms of dried psychedelic mushroom than 100 kilograms of salt. Right? So, the <clears throat> but the trade routes were also used to transport knowledge. So what they were bringing is writings, and, and, and this is particularly true of the, uh, the huge library in Alexandria in. Uh, in ancient times, that uh, had actually had a million and a half books in, in Alexandria. Uh, uh, it was all burned, but Julius Caesar burned part of it, and then Coptic mobs burned the rest of it. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, so, the, the, the writings, but, but also particularly what happened with when these ships traveled, they brought missionaries. So you had missionaries coming from India and missionaries coming from India. They had their writings and their cults and their ideas. And they brought these on the trade routes and exchanged them. So in this way, the, what, what are known as the wisdom sayings moved around from country to country. The wisdom sayings and occultic practices were moved and adapted into new settings and became woven into new cultures. Now, also, uh, logically, this occurred by conquest. As armies moved like waves across the continents with the rise and fall of empires. So, taking with the new cults and philosophies and actually bringing back cultic practices from conquered lands. So, there was a, a continuing, continuing toing and throwing of ideologies and cultic practices. Right. So, next one. <coughs> Now, okay, we're getting a little bit closer to it. This down here is Suma. Now, this is a, this was a major uh, empire, 4,500 BC. They found the earliest writing has been found here. Um, and they actually found huge libraries. It, they were prolific writers, but most of the stuff they found were, were uh, documents to do with trade, um, but they also found other things like the Gilgamesh and uh, <clears throat> a lot of poems and, and uh, cultural, uh, cultural stuff. So we know a lot about Sumer. Ne next door to it going up here is, is Akkad, uh, and uh, 
there also you've got Babylon and uh, Elam and anyway, so. <clears throat> so the the Sumerians, the, the, the Sumerian Empire lasted from 4,500 BC to about 1900 BC, so that's at least two and a half thousand years that, that they were there. They were very advanced, right? Um, they, um, they had writing, we just spoke about They had water, water and irrigation projects, and they also had effective government based on a legal system. So it's actually a pretty advanced society. Um, the, um, the, the Akkadian Empire rose in about uh, 2350 BC until about 2100 BC. So it was only about 250 years. They were pretty good too. And, but they, they were rather empires that swept through the Middle East, bringing cultures, religious practices, to new territory, and acquiring local philosophy during their rule. Now these included particularly the Egyptian Empire, which, which uh, uh, everybody in the West has tried to play down, but the Egyptian Empire was, was a lot of stuff that comes from this kind of Egypt. The Mesopotamian Empire, the Persian Empire, the Elamite Empire, the Seleucid Empire, the Hittite Empire, the Macedonian Empire, Parthian Empire, the Assyrian Empire, last but not least, the Roman Empire, right? So the point is that ideas and local religious practices particularly the wisdom sayings, moved around, making the concept of divine revelation, as far as I can see, a bit hard to swallow. Right. So, so these uh, things that just suddenly appear and come down from heaven, it just moved around. But anyway, <coughs> right, next one. Oh, isn't she gorgeous? Hi. <laughs> now, They found a whole part, bundle of figures like figurines like these. And these things are not very big, they're only about the yay high. Tiny little figurines. So this is a pregnant woman, she's obviously exaggerated. And <clears throat> so we can know from archaeology that fertility cults predate modern religions. We thought this is 12,000 BC stuff here, right? So <clears throat> Uh, many near figurines have been found dating from 12,000 BC. Female fertility and feminine power were profoundly important in the Stone Age society. Stone Age society. Right. So these guys, they understood and they revered feminine. So these were people that were utterly aware of the delicate balance between man and the forces of nature. Now the earliest man questioned the origins of life. How could he ensure his survival against the forces of nature that were always greater than he was? The, the winds blew his shelter, the sun baked its crops, wild beasts would prey on his animals, and his struggle to survive was relentless. But he was an intense observer of the natural world. He heard thunder, he saw, and he felt rain. And the earth flourishes with rain, so rain is a source of life, right? And then he saw that male ejaculation made life in woman. So it followed that rain must be divine spermatozoa ejected by the mighty penis in the sky to the womb of Mother Earth. Oh, I don't just love it. If so, so it followed that rain must be divine spoons, though. That, uh, sorry. That man's, so man's efforts to stimulate and placate the divine penis became part of his endless struggle to survive. <laughs> oh, I'm glad you like it. Now, <laughs> uh, John Allegro, who was a uh, the person I basically was talk on. Uh, 
consider that this is the actual origin of religion. This is man replicating the, uh, the divine thing in the sky, right? So, one of the Sumerian names for God was Mighty Penis, as you'd expect. So, logically, man needed to stimulate the heavenly phallus to complete its orgasm. And he did this by singing and dancing and orgiastic displays and above all, the performance of copulation and song. We're talking about Sumerian, right? Three, four thousand BC. So he believed that if he could have some influence over the power of nature, then he would become more like a god. Uh, no longer living in fear of snow or drought that killed his cattle or starved his children. And he came over a long period of time to believe that the heavenly penis was not only the source of rain which he saw as God's life-giving semen, but also that it, it, it was a source of knowledge. Hence, of all, it's a really for a long, long period of time, the seed of God became the word of God. So these things sort of transmute into, into theology. So ancient Sumerian society believed when observing storms that a divine penis in the sky would rise and spurt its jism into the earth below. <laughs> which would open its vulva and bring forth abundance. Well, as you expect. Now we can see the influence. No, quite serious. We can see the influence of these ideas being represented by the red glands of penis. Now hang on, I'll read this. Uh, this little, this little digger here. He's a he's a Sumerian priest, and and, and and if he was coloured, you would see that he would have had a red uh, a little skull cap on and, and his thing, and actually. This is in honor of the divine penis, because he's trying to imitate uh, this thing up here. So he's actually dressed as the penis. This is the whole point. <laughs> so you can see the, uh, the influence of these ideas in the red glands penis, like headgear worn by the Sumerian temple priests. Ah, okay, this is getting more interesting now. <laughs> they were all... <coughs> They, they were also smeared with the sap of certain plants, particularly the sap of a, a certain type of wild cucumber that looked um, uh, very much like a human phallus and rather attacking leaked sap from the end, uh, and which they saw as nature or God's sperm. As on special occasions, they actually even, this is the Sumerian priests, okay? They, and not, they smeared themselves with human sperm for now, The harvesting of which, here we go, the harvesting which was the duty, duty of the temple priestesses, those lovely girls, temple pro, the cultic prostitute. Now these fine ladies, whose other task included tendering and nurturing the fruit of the gods, which was a term for the land of the sky and mushroom, they, they Particularly, they were very interested in bodily fluids, and they kind of did stuff with that and got their mushrooms growing like popsies. You know? So this was the magic meal that was the key to the other world by which the initiates could experience or have direct personal connection with heaven. So the, the mushroom is psychoactive, and it, it, it's very tricky to grow, particularly in the Middle East. And, uh, so that's uh, what they were doing. Right, <clears throat> this, the next one, this is the uh, henbane fruit. Um, uh, uh, the calyx, which is the outside uh, fluffy, uh, the leafy bit, surrounds a fruit, uh, which is a red fruit, again, looking like the, the, that little head here. And so the famous historian Josephus, in his second book, Jewish Antiquities, describes the headdress of Jewish priests as resembling hen, henbane. So Josephus was very specific in a lot of stuff that he described. So Allegro continued that this 
was a continuation of the Sumerian fertility cult priest dress into the uh, Jewish, uh, the Hebrew uh, priests. Now, next on, here we go. Now this is actually uh, Solomon's temple. And these things at the front are the great columns. And it's the layout of Solomon's temple, which is all the hallmarks of the Sumerian fertility cult. Uh, this, is, this layout is typical over most of the Middle and Near East. The design could be seen as a representation of female reproductive organs. There are the outer labia, the inner labia, the vagina, and the uterus. Now, the outer labia are the two great columns you see here. They actually had names, uh, and there's a, there's a lot of uh, culture associated with the great columns. So they, their, their names, in, uh, <coughs> well, one of the names for them was Boaz, was one of them, and the other one was called uh, Jarkin. Jarkin, yeah, he knows it. And they, and mythically, they were uh, topped by the Arch of Heaven, which is uh, Shalom. Uh, it's actually just the clouds, but it's there. It's, it's seen as holding it up. So <clears throat> the, um, the inner labia are the great doors to the temple. They have massive doors. And the vagina is where select people would stand, as in the Sumerian temples. And the priests dressed as a penis and smeared with various saps and resins, wearing his glossy red skull cap, representing the divine semen would advance through the outer, por outer porch or labia into the main hall. And then, on very special occasions, he would penetrate into the, u the, into the uterus or inner sanctum where the God himself dwelt to consummate the act. Now, in the inner sanctum was placed in Solomon's time the Ark of the Covenant, which you can see is kind of an egg. I can see just all, it's, we're just following the Sumerian uh, layout. Now the Holy of Holies was separated from the main temple, part of the body of the temple, by a full curtain. And in the Holy of Holies they burned uh, incense. The incense, uh, and the smoke of which was a was a cassia bark, uh, probably mixed with aromatic herb. <clears throat> and the cassia bark contains 2% of dimethyltryptamine, which is DMT, which is the stuff that goes wallop in magic mushrooms, and is the active ingredient in entheogens used by the mystics and priests to briefly access the heavenly realm. Uh, today, Christian ritual and architecture follow the same template, where priestly ceremony re reaches a realistic, a ritualistic climax before the altar. And so they're still burning stuff and swimming in the random noise. So they, they stick with the tradition. It's Sumerian, isn't it? So <clears throat> here we go, next one. Ah, oh, look at these, aren't these gorgeous? The, I couldn't find any of uh, the uh, pictures of the uh, older temple uh, cultic prostitutes, but these are, are from Greece, and this is uh, the, from the, the temple of Dionysus, the cult of Dionysus. Dionysus. Um, so curiously, there were there were also male prostitutes, the temple prostitutes, who were uh, often contemptuously referred to in Sumerian writings as dogs. I don't know why they possibly referred to the method of copulation. Uh, so no doubt they, they had their job in harvesting the uh, priests' jism so that they could spare themselves with that to go about their priestly business. And I can't see that anything's changed really. <laughs> 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 but, uh, now the god of blood is jealous, only allowing brief moments when mortals could share his divinity in very special circumstances. Uh, for those who experience 
the divine presence, uh, it, mushroom entrance divine presence. The colours were brighter, the sounds more penetrating, and the senses become magnified in every way in pursuit of this fleeting glimpse of heaven. So men have died and religions have been born in this way. Now, what else? Let's get back to the interesting stuff. The Sumerian farmer, back in 3000 BC, was known to stimulate his crops after planting by copulating with his wife in the fields. And you put up, it's just remember the, the vine thing up there actually gets lots of put rain on the, on the crops, so they needed rain, so this is how they did it, by stimulating it. And, you know? So, <clears throat> the initiates into the, mis into the religious mysteries created ceremonies in which religious mysteries are, are all part of this whole thing, right? So, they created ceremonies in which their priestesses would seduce the god to draw him into their grasp as a woman fascinates her partner's penis to erection. These are very fruity times, guys. Uh, right? It's not like today. We've become very much tamed down. So this feminine power to fascinate and stimulate is central to the fertility cult. Right? It's central to its practices and its logic. And this is absolutely no doubt why, in the male-dominated religions, they go out of their way to suppress females. Because they're just trying to the feminine power. So, the key to the door of the heavenly realm and the fleeting view of the divine was through certain special plants. Now, these drug herbs had been used and cultivated for centuries. They were carefully observed with consumption and experimentation in various combinations by the ancient shaman. These are the gods who had the secret knowledge of plants. They were the chosen of their god. And they, the shaman, had access to heaven. Now this access to the divine realm was part of a secret rite where, <coughs> a bit like a retreat, you know, where intense bodily and mental preparation needed to be undertaken before the god in mushroom form was ingested. Now the initiates were bound in secrecy with fearful oaths to protect the knowledge and secrets of the cult. Now, these secrets were not written down. They were passed by word of mouth from priest to initiate. That this secret knowledge gave the temples and their priestly functionaries power as well as revenue. Right. <clears throat> so they've got this little trick. Uh, looked at as a unique business proposition, the temple controlled direct experience of the divine. It gave its devotees hope and support, together with teachings and wisdom, and also gave them, it helped them with medical knowledge, and in return, it collected offerings of produce, animals, ownership of land, and rents for the land. So it was a good living for a successful temple, and uh, actually not hard work for a relatively easy life. Uh, it, the op uh, alternative option was to work on the land and break your back all day long. So it's a hell of a sight easier to be a priest. So the temples became rich. Now, it was this temple wealth that often attracted conquerors, and the plunder of the rich temples paid for their army. So people would target somewhere where they knew there was a lot of a lot of money and a lot of wealth, and they would just go and grab it. Alexander the Great did that. And, you know, if you name any of the famous king, Henry VIII in England, more recently, shut down the monasteries because he needed to join money. You know? So, <clears throat> let's go to the next one. Ah! 
Now this, this lady here is Lady Caporet, and there's this character that's called over here, this horse. And between them and connecting them, the flowers in the air, these are datura flowers. And these things are as, as poisonous as all get out, unless you prepare them in a special certain way. And if you do that, then they become actually quite either, quite strongly psychoactive. So Lady Pepper was clearly a very, very important priestess. She, she had the knowledge of these, of, of these secret things. Now, just, just as a, uh, if you want to know a bit more about this, uh, here you've got uh, the lotus flower, and over here you've got the narcotic water lily. Now, leaning over the top of it, that great arch, this is the goddess Nut who's, who's doing the stuff. And uh, of course, is uh, uh, the god in one of these shapes. I can't remember which one. So <clears throat> it's, um, it's quite, a, but clearly they're using uh, entheogens in Egypt in a big way. So in Sumer, uh, they used uh, the Amanita muscaria mushroom. And in Akkad, they used, uh, as it happened, a cassia tree. And in, but in Palestine, which is, was sort of interesting in a way, uh, they used the Amanita mushroom. They used Syrian root. Now, Syrian root just as a, get out, grows prolifically on Mount Sinai, to, to, just to fill you with a picture. It's, <laughs> Damn stuff. Sends you off your tree, so to speak, if you have too much of it. Right. <clears throat> they also use that acacia, the acacia tree where the bark is 2% dimethyl tryptamine. And the, the leaves are 1%. Um, and they also use henbane. Um, but in the Old Testament, just remember, you've got the burning bush and you've got visions that are all happening in the shade of acacia tree. So it, this stuff's all woven into it all. Now, in, in Greece, uh, the uh, Eleusinian mystery, which is a massive mystery, really famous in Greece, a, a, a one of four or five different ones. They used uh, ergot, which is the mold that grows on. They also used it, used it and probably mixed it with cannabis. Um, in Europe, they used henbane, belladonna, mandrake, uh, hang on, I need to get these things up here. Uh, Mandrake, is that one? This is uh, the acacia tree. Up here is, uh, is uh, Syrian rue. And up there, we all know, is our favorite mushroom, right? <clears throat> so, let's get to the next one. Now, this talk wouldn't be complete without talking about Australia. Now, indigenous Australians used the paturi bush, which they got the leaves and dried them, and they mixed it with acacia ash, and they chewed it as a plug, and that, that worked for them too. So, uh, we don't want to be left alone here. We've been at it too for 40,000 years. Now, right, this is John Marco Allegro. He's an, and the book that caused the absolute sensation when he produced it 40 odd years ago is uh, The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross. And this is a cover of the reprinted version that just came out a few years ago, uh, which uh, I read and uh, uh, Doug read. And so we've all had a look at it. It's, a, it's a much, very much of a knockout. It's a very interesting, bit of a hard read, actually. Now, um, he, Allegra is a remarkable scholar of ancient Semitic languages. Uh, and uh, after the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in 1947, came to life, uh, he was one of the eight man team of scholars who were given the chance at the job of translating them. Now, he was the only British person on the eight man team. And it, it, it he was the only agnostic as well, right? I've got to tell you. I thought, I thought he'd been a Methodist preacher. Uh, before I think originally he was 
started trying to, he'd been on a seminary, yeah. and then he had sort of seen the light and said, yeah, right, so I'm not gonna, not gonna do it. Yeah. And then he, he actually went to Cambridge to do Danish languages. And, uh, anyway, okay. So, uh, the other, the other ones of the remaining seven, I think five of them were Dominican monks, all right? It's, it's, it's translating this damn stuff. The two of them were actually a very, very senior Catholics anyway. So the, the, uh, the other seven were all really heavy duty Catholics. So Allegro was the only one of these eight people to publish material of the translations. The other ones sat on it and they didn't publish. And uh, the, the, if you're interested, the, the, the scandal of the, of the Dead Sea Scrolls is like, <coughs> you read it, it's like a bloody uh, spy, spy game. It's ridiculous what they've got up to. So uh, it, it, this, was the, this was a huge scandal as the only contemporary documents from the time of Christ were kept hidden from the general public for 50 years, right? by a church that didn't welcome scrutiny or comparison. Uh, I just want to make it clear, and I, I don't know how much you know about this stuff, but there are no documents at all anywhere from the time of Christ. There's nothing. Right? And there are no original documents. Everything that is passed to us is a, this, a, you know, this letter or this gospel or whatever are copies, 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 and all of that shit has been redacted and rescinded beyond belief. In other words, it's been tailored to suit the needs of the church leaders. Now, the scrolls, Dead Sea Scrolls, are original. They're original and authentic. Uh, probably as, as a, is a Nakamadi library as well, but that's a bit later. Uh, <clears throat> And there's no wonder that the church worked so hard to play them down as irrelevant. And the, the, what the game was, typical church move, they pushed it to the background. And if that gave them time to organize the cover story, oh, this is irrelevant, it's nothing to do with it. It's bloody well totally irrelevant. And that they just didn't want comparison of their, their, their little game, right? So, it's not about truth. It never has been about truth. It's about control and power. Right. Curiously, ah, look at this, isn't she lovely? Now, this is Sibylle. Now, she was a really, really big uh, uh, goddess, particularly in, in Rome as well as in uh, Greece. Uh, we'll get to her in a minute. The Amanita Muscari mushroom, in, which in Sumerian, which in Sumerian writing, which has no vowels, it's like these Middle Eastern writings, it's got no vowels, only consonants. Right? Uh, it, the core of the word about Amanita Muscari mushroom has got the letters P T R in the center in, in Sumerian. Right? And curiously, this is also P T H uh, a Y H, which was also the name of the Hebrew cultic goddess. Now. Later, she was removed and scrubbed off the whole Hebrew register as they, they got rid of her and they got rid of Ishtar and Astarte and they made a good job of getting rid of, of Petria. And now, it, the, her name meant seeing, explaining, and interpreting. But she's very much like, uh, uh, like Sibylle. And she's, she simply has got multiple breasts and the, the, this, she's a dark. Uh, <clears throat> um, so, it's, it's, she's very much like uh, Ishtar, Astarte, Sibley, Isis, Demeter, Persephone, and also Eve. And her divine milk was the magical drink that was consumed by initiates, right, uh, on their journey to the realm of the gods. So it's, it's, it's that. Then in 1970, John Allegro published a remarkable book, The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross, which showed a clear connection between the fertility cult of 3000 BC through to the stained glass windows and church frescoes of 1100 AD. Right? 
Now he showed that the words move between languages with only minor alterations, but largely retaining their meaning. Now the book caused absolute uproar with condemnation from critics who by and large hadn't read the book. And certainly, they certainly hadn't read the 150 pages of detailed scholarly footnotes. But now, just curiously, 150 years after Allegro's death, he's got a lot more support from senior academics. By and large, can't find anybody who's disagreeing with him. They all say yeah, he was on the money, but they're all too bloody scared of the church to say much. Now, we're about to stop never break, but uh, just give me one second. Allegro's work as a philologist, as a language expert, led him to look at the movement of words and ideas between cultures, and specifically the word for psilocybin mushroom and sumerian contained consonants PTR within the body of the word, and there's no vowels. So he showed that the PTR format moved from sumerian to Akkadian to Syriac, and then into Phoenician and Hebrew. So which allowed some words and phrases to be understood in entirely different ways so, and, and uh, changing traditional translations radically. Right. So he showed how scholars had fudged translations to arrive at meanings, at, at meanings agreeable to the priesthood that were entirely different from the more accurate alternative reading of the ancient texts. And he demonstrated that the Old Testament often referred to the use of entheogens, which are mushrooms, like, as common practice. But for example, that manna, that, you know, manna from heaven and pops up overnight and the hungry Hebrews go and eat them and stuff. And, and Moses called this the bread of the Lord. So uh, they were into it. That, okay. Are we, good to, are we good to rock and roll? Okay. So, um, <clears throat> they, um, it, what they have done is to just try to fit the, the, un, the difficult word just into their global, uh, their global sense of how they thought it might be have been translated. And actually it wasn't the truth at all because when Allegro started looking at some words, he would take them apart and say, actually look at this, this is these letters mean this, and that the actual what they're dri driving at with the word is something entirely different from the way it's ever been translated, which is what the which is where uh, you ran into headlong into war with you know, the church authorities. On that and just about everything else. So, <clears throat> Allegro showed that portraying Yahweh as a pure desert god was false, and that he could philologically, i.e., through language, be tied to the Indo European Zeus, and that the common name for Jehovah and Zeus uh, came from the Sumerian word meaning spermatozoa or the sacred use of life. So they're both going back to the mighty penis, right? So he's it, 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 not a desert god at all. I mean, to add insult to injury, so to speak, he considered that the Sumerian fertility cult concept of death followed by rebirth is seen in the way that growth in spring follows death in winter had found its latest form in the new mystery religion of Christianity. Don't think it's not a mystery religion, that's exactly what it is. But he showed that the Last Supper being the central ceremony of Christianity was simply a copy of the Sumerian temple ceremony, where initiates were given a meal of Amanita Mascara and mushroom, so that they briefly and intensely experienced the other world of the gods. Thus, it followed that Israelite mythology could positively be related to the very earliest strata of Middle Eastern culture. And it followed that both Abraham and Moses 
where a Sumerian is the Gilgamesh. It's just all up. The publication of Allegro's book caused absolute uproar as both the Jewish faith and the Christian churches, together with many other religiously inclined academics, defended their entrenched positions. All of them, all of them, without exception, were totally unwilling and unable to consider re-examination of centuries-old translations. Now, curiously, as it turned out, his greatest critic by far wasn't an academic. It was a character called Gordon Weissman, who was that odd amateur mycologist, i.e. mushroom, but, but Weissman was a really senior banker. He was, um, he was a, uh, a vice president of J.P. Morgan. <laughs> right? <clears throat> this is power and money, fellas. It's all about this stuff. Right? Wasson had also published a book about the use of psilocybin in mushrooms. And he showed that the mushrooms were known <clears throat> as soma in the Rig Veda of Hinduism. Right? Have anybody here heard of the soma? No? And the, it's the Amanita mushroom. And that they were central to other very early cultures, including Zoroastrianism. Right, so now there were, so actually some Russian archaeologists have uncovered a grave in uh, Mongolia or something, and it's got Zoroastrian stuff in it, and it's clearly they're using mushrooms. They've found some weavings that, are, that actually show Amanita mushrooms of the Zoroastrian priest and stuff. <coughs> Quite interesting. Anyway, Wasson flatly denied any connection of the mushroom cult with Christianity. He said, no, 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 absolutely not. There's a, maybe just a bit of Genesis, but it's nothing to do with Christ. Stop, absolutely stop dead. So I said, bollocks, it's, it's with us today, right? It much later transpired that Gordon Wasson's particular client as a banker was the fact <laughs> Come on, guys! And the Wesson regularly met alone with the Pope. So the Pope was a Vatican stooge, right? It's just that he could have kept it covered. It wasn't until he was dead that they worked it out. Actually, it was uh, 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 someone who described it the name. Uh, <coughs> Right. Ah, come on. Right. So these are images from either sacred books or stained glass windows in Europe. Right. <coughs> uh, I think they're predominantly books. Is things like the Canterbury Psalter, which is a really, really important book for about that money. Here, yeah, look at this Adam and Eve, and behind them is the bloody mushroom. All right, so is that trying to tell you something? Now, here, look, you've got Eve. Here's a mushroom tree, right? This snake is climbing up the tree, giving Eve a mushroom. Come on, what's it trying to tell you? Right? Come on, wake up. Right, Adam and Eve up here, right? Mushrooms behind it. They're doing, it's, 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 the church knew about mushrooms, always has done. <clears throat> this is, this is them venerating. Don't know what the devil's doing in here, he's having a bit of fun, isn't he? But, anyway. <coughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> he's been made, come on. <laughs> he's just having fun. <clears throat> now these are images from early manuscripts and church windows from the period 1100 to about 1300. There are many examples of psychedelic mushrooms in early religious armor all over Europe. Now, if anybody can be bothered, you plug into your, into your Google, you write in mushrooms and early Christian art. All right, do you want to, anybody want to do that? Just do that. You knock your socks off. Right. <clears throat> They're all over the place, these, these mushrooms. It, what they did is they hid them in plain sight. Right? So, so this is, it, you think, how do they get away with this? Well, they bloody well did, because it's, a, it's you're sworn to secrecy. If you're technically, you're not telling anybody. 
So people did never really look at this as a sacred picture that nobody ever questioned it. <laughs> right. So Allegro showed in his work on the Dead Sea Scroll translations that the mushroom cult had been foundational in the Christian myth. A myth, all right. Curiously, mushrooms. No, we can be ordered. Mushrooms are best dried, both for preservation and to make them digestible. Right? If you eat them raw, the, the amanita mushroom, you'll get really, you'll get really sick. But if you dry the thing, it goes, undergoes a little chemical change. Now, here's where this gets really interesting. <clears throat> the dried mushroom cap becomes golden brown in color, and then. When re-soaked, resembles a small loaf of bread. Furthermore, in the final stages of the growth of the mushroom cap, it actually inverts. So it goes from a sort of mushroom cap like that to inverting that way up, all right? It forms an inverted cup or grail. And the water added to this cup turns red, and it's highly psychoactive. Thus, the body of God is eaten with, with and the wine is drunk as, as, as the, the divine blood. And the carefully prepared initiate after a while then experiences the divine world and has a glimpse of heaven. That's so simple, isn't it? Right, here we go. <laughs> There's the man himself, and what's he got? That's not a biscuit, guys, it's a mushroom, all right? <laughs> oh, what's he telling you? All right? <sighs> this is, this, these are off stained glass windows and so I think that this is not thing, I think this is out of a book, right? Uh, I have to tell you where it came from, I've got no idea. Um, it, it was the sacred, this is the sacred meal and the sacred drink gave visions of the divine realm. And it, it, the very strong re-emergence of the mushroom cult in about 1100 AD could well have been from the returning crusaders, bringing back ideas to Europe. Now, they've already got this looking around in the, in the folk stuff in Europe. But the Crusaders came back and they brought it back from the Holy Land. And they fired this stuff up. I mean, they went just, if you probably know, the Crusaders brought back the veneration of the Virgin Mary. It would never happen before 1100 AD. They brought it back and all of a sudden she's the biggest thing since uh, sliced bread. Uh, there were countless hallucinogenic mushrooms on stained glass windows and pictures and sacred books and carvings and into church decoration. You've got carved into the, all the externals and internals of churches. There are bloody mushrooms. They're all over the place. It, it, also in Europe. St. Martin's Church in Germany, for example, has got a mushroom child carved into its jolly entrance of the, of the church. Right. Um, the date from about 1100 to actually right up until about 1550, at which time the Reformation movement started to take hold and things changed. Now, here we go. This, this have a feast here. This is my favourite. God, you wouldn't believe it, really, honestly. Here, here's a mushroom, and this thing over that hangs down underneath it is called the Universal Veil. So as the mushroom's growing up, it's gone from its sort of egg stage, it starts to spread itself out and the, the, the veil drops down underneath. Well, this is bloody carnal and he's got he's dressed as a mushroom. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> it's it, this isn't a coincidence. This is deliberate, alright? And here we've got the grail cup, mushrooms inverted put water in it, you're off. Okay. <laughs> water placed in the mushroom grail cup becomes red in colour and the psychoactive water becomes wine. I've heard that time. So this body of 
Christ and blood of Christ. You know, come on, they're off their tickets, these guys. So the, the church always claimed that it's anchored in tradition. However, this appears to be the Sumerian tradition. Okay? Good with that? All right, so now, this would talk wouldn't be complete without talking about South America. And these little stone carvings come from the Amazon. The Amazon. Uh, now, ayahuasca is the dimethyltryptamine drug that they produce in the Amazon. Just think about it. You've got 150,000 plant species in the Amazon. And uh, how on earth would they know that if you boil the leaves of one plant with the uh, stem of, the, of a climbing vine, you'd open the gates to the mystic world? And so the particular leaves contain dimethyltryptamine. And the vine contains a monoamine inhibitor. So that Without which, the uh, you can't digest it because the it, it won't digest because you've got to inhibit it. If you just leave, take take the leaves, it doesn't do anything. So what they did is they boiled this stuff to it became a kind of sticky goo, and t apparently it tastes absolutely foul. Um, and uh, the early missionaries were astonished that the visions that they experienced after they consumed ayahuasca exactly paralleled the bizarre visions that are throughout the book of Revelation uh, as well as the book of Daniel. So clearly the, those guys were... Uh, uh, yes, go ahead. Okay, next one. Gold cat mushrooms, uh, they're the same ones that are shown in many of the medieval windows and texts. Uh, we can find these in Sydney if you look around now. Uh, these are the red cap mammoths, and these are the uh, gold cap uh, psilocybin, or whatever it is. Right, not quite the back in names. <coughs> now, this is interesting. This is a fresco from the Plain Carrado Church. Now this is a church that uh, was built in about 1100 by the uh, Knights Hospital, who were uh, the, uh, basically the same as the Knights of St. John, I think. And they it built in about 1150 when they returned from the Crusades. Now it clearly shows, here we have this, it's, this is nearly a thousand years old, so it, you know, done. There's an amanita mushroom sort of drawn as a tree, and curled up around it is snaky again. And he's got in his mouth, he's got the mushroom, and he's giving it to Eve. Right. Offering a mushroom cap to Eve. Now, here is the story of Eve consuming the forbidden fruit and then seeing visions of good and evil. Good stuff, isn't it? Right. This <clears throat> just not too far away from Plain Road is uh, the church of Saint Martin de Vic in also in southern France. It's only about twelve kilometers away. And uh, this again, I'm not sure which, which order built the church, but this fresco that is the Last Supper. Now, you don't have to look too hard to see that what is purported to be a loaf there is actually a mushroom, right? And so, you're hiding in plain sight. Now the initiated person, no, straight away, this is a, the, what the meal, the Last Supper is about eating mushrooms. Right? But everybody else thinks they're eating bread. Clever, right? isn't it? So, We just come, let's, let's talk a bit about uh, the Sami. Now, this guy here is a Sami shaman. And well, the, the Sami are, are reindeer herders in northern Russia and Finland. 
and they uh, these guys they followed the foraging reindeer and the reindeer's favorite food was the Amanita mushroom so they dug the mushrooms up under fir trees and they found them through winter snow uh, and the herders when they when they went mushroom hunting wore the spotted red gown because it's, it's a kind of traditional thing it's kind of honor of the thing that you pick uh, there's a lot of tradition about how you pick the mushroom and how you honor it and venerate it but anyway. so they wore the spotted red gown to harvest the mushroom and they delivered them to the snowbound houses of their village through a door or a hole in the roof they couldn't get in through the door because it was six foot of snow there. Right. So they'd bring the mushrooms in through the roof and they'd hang them in a string sack over the fire to dry. Because you've got to dry the damn things or it'll kill you otherwise. So here we have the adapted legend of Father Christmas or Santa Claus or whatever. And with, we've got reindeer uh, and bright red decorations. So someone out here. Red decorations, trees. So the Santa Claus figure. Man, come on, it's all there, right? Nothing's new as it. Everything is copied. Now, okay, but just powdered dried mushrooms were taken as snuff by the Vikings. Now, you're about to go into battle, you snuff up a certain stuff. And you absolutely you make them fearless and give them incredible energy. So it was that these are the berserkers that uh, are so famous of the uh, of the Viking warriors. They just lose all idea of danger or whatever. They just went berserk, didn't they? So everybody was scared to death of them. Um, so the same legend is woven into the stories of fairies, elves, pixies, little people. And we see it again in Alice through the Living Glass, which is a loose carrot. Right? Red, it was actually called the Reverend Charles Dodgson, as you know. Now, the church despised competition and annihilated all opposition. They initially concentrated on eliminating the Druids, well, the sort of Romans, but you know, say the church. And who were the, the Druids were the spoken book, books and centers of knowledge of the Celtic tribes. And later they moved to getting rid of the village healers and the shamans who still followed the earlier fertility-based folk cultures. And it actually, it's quite interesting. They've, they've got stuff in France where they interview people who are in witches' cults. And uh, they also, they loved it. It was great fun and uh, with lots of bonking. <laughs> it's just that sort of period. Um, they called them witches and wizards, and they hunted them with fury, disposing of them with hideous tortures. But they just don't want competition. So, the final one. Uh, here we have Santa in a spotted red thing and red coat, just like the Sami shaman of Russia and Finland. And notice on the tree, you've got the magic mushroom decorations, and everything is a copy of something else, isn't it? Or a copy of something else. So now, as I conclude my talk, I hope I've taken you atheists on an interesting trip. That's where the legend might have come from. If the mushrooms were so prevalent in Christian church culture, why are they not so prominent now? And why is even the Christ most Christian churches specifically against the use of psychedelics, which otherwise are still popular, repopularized by, say, the neo pagan? Uh, uh, activities of some new age groups and the like. Why are they so anti-psychedelic now if it was there before? I just think they're embarrassed. 
embarrassed about it, really. But <laughs> they know perfectly well that the mushroom culture is the basis of Christianity. They don't. Hey, but the church has always been very comfortable with drugs. Uh, if anybody's interested, go and get yourself a book called uh, Operation Gladio. And it tells you how the Vatican and the CIA and the Mafia ran heroin for 50 years. Yeah, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, not kidding. It started in 1945 and they ran it right up until the year 2000. It, it, it's, it, it's all, but Operation Caddy is all based on, on court records and stuff like that. It's actually a really, it's, it's quite a dense book. It's half of its footnotes telling you where they got the information from. Church loves drugs. They like the money. Right. Hippie. Um, Francine. All right. I, I I'm ready. I took your advice and looked in Google, and I found lots and lots of pictures of, of mushrooms and all sorts of religious connections. But it does say, was Jesus a mushroom? Ah, yes, well. Actually, that's the whole point, because he, this is a remembrance of me, this is my body, this is my blood, all this sort of stuff. Of course, uh, it, when you have a cult, what, what's going on is that you, you don't actually refer to stuff by name. So, Allegro's... Okay, oh, sorry. Allegro's viewpoint was that uh, uh, everything's referred to as a pseudonym. So Allegro said, well, maybe Jesus is a pseudonym for the mushroom, for reading Jesus. It, look, it, people get confused. Jesus is, a, is almost certainly a mythical figure. It's, it's a, a, pastiche, a pastiche of lots of different things. And, but people have tried to peel back the layers to find the original character. And they peel back and peel back and peel back, and when you get right down to the bottom, you peel back the last layer, and there's just nothing there. There is no evidence whatsoever that there's such a person. But what you've actually got, you peel back, and you find it actually green. Really, you've got into the old uh, pagan cultures, which were very inclusive, very tolerant. Uh, it's only later when they decided that, that Jesus was a divine being and that, uh, it, that he wasn't mythical, he was factual. As soon as they got to that point, they decided, well, it's only logical that anybody who doesn't agree with us has to be killed. So this is when they started uh, 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 hunting down and getting rid of any other alternative Christian viewpoints, such as the Gnostics, and then they started attacking the Jews and anybody else. So this didn't happen until later, but it, it, it's, yeah, it's all part of this kind of lunacy that goes on, and they know as well as anybody else that it's all myth. Right. Just a brief comment I read today where former Pope Benedict XVI was blaming the pedophilia in the Catholic Church on the loose morals of the 1960s. So sorry, what was that done? The, the former Pope, Benedict XVI, I read today in the, in the news, where he was blaming the incidents of pedophilia in the Catholic Church, a, a Catholic priest, on, on the loose morals of the 1960s, which I suggest might be a reference to people using mas magic mushrooms to hallucinate. <laughs> Just I don't think that just shows how fucked up they are. Exactly. <laughs> I, 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 look, it, it, they have never taken responsibility for it. No. It, they've never, ever taken responsibility. Even now that they've been exposed, completely exposed for, for the bunch of pedophile rascals that they are, they still will not say that if we find a pedophilia within the church, we will call the police. They say we will treat it within the church. They are terrified of anybody looking over them, and uh, that's uh, and they will resist that with a dying breath. They don't want any kind of supervision. And yeah, 
basically as soon as you find them, you should lock them up. Hi. Yeah, um, when I was at university, I did a course in microbiology. Um, I oh, do remember oh, one. Yeah. yeah, I do remember one very interesting um, lecture where our professor was talking about um, we're talking about fungus and mold, and he was suggesting that it's, it was possible that in the Middle Ages, when you had the witch hunts and mouse hysteria, he was talking about certain molds that grow on grain that isn't stored properly and there's issues with dampness. Yeah, yeah, they the, get the, the mold the, growing on them. That, yeah, yeah, that when the, people eat this, the mold on barley yeah, and stuff. Yeah. yeah, they can get hallucinations, and that could have been a cause for the outbreaks of hysteria and witch burnings and other sort of. Yeah. What's your um, thoughts on that? That's exactly wrong. The, uh, I, I did just, I, I sort of covered it. I just, the, um, the, the mold that grows on barley was the, was the basis of the, uh, of, of the visions that they had in the mystery religions, in, in, certainly in Greece, in the Eleusinian mysteries. And the ergot is, a, is what we're talking about. And it's a very powerful drug, and yes, you start eating uh, moldy, moldy food, and everybody will start going off their trees. <laughs> huh? They all start having visions. You think that the devil is coming to get them and stuff. Why not? They go. We don't realize. We look back. You've got no idea how superstitious these guys are. They're t absolutely, totally superstitious. They've got to be superstitious. They've got no knowledge. You get hit by something, and you've got to say, "Oh, it's a." The divine power is that we've done something wrong. We haven't uh, done our rituals right. Not that we're, we've got, everything's filthy and we're all getting germs and diseases. You know, it's just they, they, it was all it was the only thing they had. Sorry. All right, hit me. Hi there. Um, thanks for the talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, well, well, I'm trying to keep it entertaining for you. Thank you. Uh, we are very interested in the divine feminine. Too. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. Well, my question is kind of related. Um, so I'm wondering what what lessons there may be for the future, and particularly... Oh, I can help you very much with that. Go on, yeah. Oh, it, great. Um, and just this idea that religion brings people together, and there's a common mission, and I, I wonder, I've seen, I've lived in communities that have kind of, the bottom's fallen out, where people have lost a sense of purpose and it's kind of fallen apart. And and also the, the piece on the, the feminine, where that fits in all of this, like how we restore that balance. So I'm interested in how, how we create a sense of community, in particular in the Western world, that is very individualistic, um, and then how we restore this balance with the feminine the lessons from the past, if there are any, to go forward. Right here. But, uh, <clears throat> I need to be a bit of a philosopher to answer that. But the, okay, let's let's start with a couple of basic things. Uh, it, it, the church doesn't really help. Uh, rational humanism is just the same as anything else. It's a moral code that we all have within us. The simple issue is that you do to somebody else what you have to do, what you have them do to you. That's the basis of all religions. It doesn't have to believe in the flying penis to, build, to, 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 to get a handle on that either. So, the, uh, uh, in terms of, um, sorry, you, then you said the, uh, where, how do we have a sense of community? Yes, because my, what I've noticed is religion provides ritual. Yes, and common rich, purpose. Rich. So, yeah. I, I, I don't know if you went, if you saw the Book of Mormon, yeah. a very funny uh, play, right? And I thought I was dragged to it because I'm such a raving atheist, I, I couldn't go to anything. In particular. The Mormon thing is, uh, it, it is the, probably the biggest joke on earth. Uh, uh, why anybody would ever let themselves to get sucked into it? No idea. And the, um, but the point of the play was <laughs> this guy sort of breaks away from the Mormon leadership and starts doing his own thing. And he goes to a place which is falling to bits and is, is corrupt and is all get out. 
and suddenly by giving them this kind of moral basis, he turns it around. So it basically didn't really matter what you believed in on that subject. It, we, we only fell into Christianity by mistake. Uh, uh, the whole Jesus stuff, it was only, it, there were God men all over the place. Uh, 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 Mahan was the most successful one, really, in recent times. But there, there have been dozens and dozens and hundreds of just one or two to get through to score a goal. The, the rest all get uh, knocked over on the wayside. And it, it was just as likely, it was just as likely that we were going to be uh, all worshipping Mithra. Uh, Mithra was the main god of the Roman Empire. And it, it was just touch and go with a, a, it, they would end up by by going with Mithraism as the, the religion of the Roman Empire or with Christianity. And as it happened, they went with Christianity. And, we, and when the Roman Empire fell to bits, what we had left is the Roman religion, which had actually has got nothing to do with what they might have been doing in the Middle East. Um, but it, it never needed to have had, because Christianity is a Roman religion. That's, that basically more or less starts in Rome. Mark's Gospel is written in Rome. It's a whole. The, it, it, most of the rest of it probably is written in Rome, even though the claim is written in other places. It probably isn't. Um, and oh, the sorry, feminine. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? When they got when they the Crusaders came back from the Holy Land, they. That they brought with them the cult of Mary, that he established the, the uh, not Franciscans, the uh, I forget the name now, but running out of, out of uh, Switzerland, brought it back and, and, and uh, fired it up in Europe. And then when uh, Freud in no, Jung, Jung claimed that uh, it was when they made the Virgin Mary a goddess. The Catholic Church did that in about 1900, and, and she was raised to the highest level of whatever they were the heaven on. Um, so she actually, uh, they said, "Oh, it's a wonderful day. We've finally got a feminine god." Right, so. Mm, so what, so what is the future benefit just to believe in anything? I'll get rid of the bloody church straight away. But uh, what do you put in its place? I've got no idea. Well, look, look at, uh, people often ask me what, what, what I'm into. And I say, well, I'm a blue donor. And they say, well, what do you mean by that? And I say, well, actually all I've got to do is go outside and the sky, I don't need to go into some bastard's building and, and have dusty old walls and stupid old books. I can do it on my own, thank you. You don't need to tell me what it is I want to believe in. So I think that works, but anyway, it's, it's, it's a personal thing. So, Chief, and, um, just uh, one last question, if I'm I may. Really boring, you know? one, one last question. So um, I don't know whether you know the uh, travails of Muhammad, but. Um, Nothing compares to the imagination of, of that gentleman. But, but he did spend a lot of time in caves. I'm just wondering whether you get mushrooms in caves. In fairness to Mohammed, he's incredibly original. Uh, if they, uh, he came up with stuff that was really right out there. Uh, and, uh, but I, I don't know. I think he probably did get mushrooms. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I hope you agree with me that um, that was an absolutely fabulous and enlightening talk, and uh, we really thank you, Jim, for your entertainment. It was absolutely magnificent. <laughs>